it's, it's great to be here. And uh, for me, it's particularly uh, uh, enjoyable to uh, get a chance to uh, see a lot of my old players uh, that are involved in coaching. And that's always uh, really nice. It's good that uh, when guys played for you, you didn't turn them off on the game. They, they, they want to put something back into it. And uh, Saskatchewan has an unbelievable number of great coaches. Um, uh, but can we do a better job? Yes, we can. Okay, And that's why you're here. And I really appreciate that, that you are here. You know, um, people ask me, why do you keep coaching? And I've coached for a long time. And I always tell them the same thing. It's because I keep learning. I mean, as soon as I don't learn something from a season, I think it's time to pack it in. But I just keep learning something every year that excites me and gets me going for the next year. So that's kind of why I stick with it. Uh, but I've got to be straightforward. In the KHL, they do pay you pretty well over there. Okay? <laughs> Although the Rupal went down and I wasn't real pumped about that. I had a few talks with Putin about that one. Um, I'm going to talk about being an effective coach. And uh, that's really important to us all. And you're gonna, today you're going to meet three what I think are unbelievable coaches. You've got Willie Desjardins in Vancouver. I've coached Willie, outstanding, uh, outstanding coach, outstanding person. Then you've got Glenn Gullitson, who I have, don't know a lot about Glenn, but I got to meet him last night. And when I phoned him and asked him to consider doing this, absolutely zero hesitation. He was right there. He wanted to put something back in to the game. And uh, that's the kind of people we have. And then Dave Tippett, I can't tell you what a wonderful coach he is. And he works in a very different and difficult situation in Phoenix uh, and every year makes it work. You, you talked, Mike talked last night, Mike Babcock, and uh, Mike's been and has had good places to work with good organizations. Tipper, he's a better stick handler now than he was when he played, okay? I can tell you that because he makes it work. Okay, uh, coaching. To be an effective coach, uh, you know, I often think about coaching and the one thing that always comes to my mind like one of the greatest challenges for us as coaches is, and I always, every year, about the middle of the season, I'll be looking at my team thinking the same thing. One of the challenges that we face is how can we make our hardworking, hustling guys think more? And on the other side of the coin, how can we make some of our skilled, talented guys work harder? And that is the, that's part of coaching. That's the mystery of coaching, is you have to find a way to do that. And uh, it's, we have to get players to change sometimes. And anytime you're trying to, I'll talk about this later, anytime you're trying to get people to change in any profession, there's a challenge there for you. It's not easy. Uh, I think everybody resists change a little bit. They're comfortable, don't rock the boat, that type of thing. So when we're going to try to change things, you've got to have some good ideas, you've got to be able to present it. And, and then you've got to be a, a salesman as well. That's really important. So I'm going to start off here with, uh, first of all, I'm going to start off with communication. Now there's a good one. If you're going to be a, an effective coach, you have to be a good communicator. And there's an old expression, your occupation is coaching, your job is communicating. And that's really, really true. I was talking to a guy at our HP1 the other day. A gentleman was telling me about an NHL player who plays uh, down east, and I won't tell you what team. Mike Babcock is going to coach it, though. So it's Toronto. <laughs> and this young player said, under a previous regime, not, uh, not last year, but the coach never talked to him. Like, never personally talked to him one-on-one -on -one in the course of the year. You know, in an elevator, they'd walk, ride the elevator up together and never talk to him. Well, that's not the way it is. When you get young players, you got to work with them. When you get old players, you got to work with them. There's a difference in how you work with them, but you got to work with people. And here's another point that's really important. The most important thing we can give players is our time and our attention. Because when you do that, he thinks he counts. He thinks he can make a difference. He feels part of it. He's going to give you more. So you got to find time. You just can't communicate on the ice. You've got to find time off the ice, too, to socialize with your guys, get to know them a little bit. I've always done one thing. I always make sure in training camp, I always look at the, uh, our biogs on our players. You know, their mom and dad, are they still alive, for example? Uh, brothers and sisters, where they've played, who they've played for. I like to know a little bit about the guy. 
so that when I do strike up a conversation, I can drop a few things that make him understand, wow, how did he know that? And I've always done that. And I just think it's important sometimes. It helps a guy relax a little bit and he kind of thinks, hey, this guy cares about me a little bit. That's a good thing. <coughs> All players want to know what you, the coach, are thinking about. Is there any player in hockey that doesn't want to know what you're thinking about him? He might be your best player. He might be a superstar. All players want to know what you're thinking about them as a person, as a player, their role, how good they are, how effective they are, are they helping you? So boy, players walk around a lot of times and they're just hoping you'll find the time to talk to them. They're hoping that you'll find a time to maybe take four or five minutes and discuss a few things with them. Every player wants to know what you're thinking. When you start talking to people though, one of the first things you learn after a while is your delivery is as important as the message. And it's really important. Can you give feedback at times without emotion? Because sometimes in the game, there are times, as I said before, we're trying to change people. Uh, there's times when guys make mistakes that are costly to you. Uh, you're trying to get that guy to change and, and do it differently. And so there can be some moments when it's, uh, it gets pretty heated at times. You've got to really find a way to give that feedback without too much emotion. If you can do that, the message is received better when you can do that. That's really important. Avoid generalizations. Players like to know specifically what they have to do to get more ice time, to get more responsibility. They want to know specifically what they have to do. And that's why video and stats are really good, because it's objective. Yes, you can subjectively talk about what you see, but it always helps you if you can bring some objective things to the table. And that's why right now we're into a whole new phase of analytics in hockey, which is going to help you with your players. When you combine video and analytics together, the use of stats, you can do a lot for a player. You can do a lot to play. And you can give them some specific feedback <coughs> that is very important. When I meet with a player, usually I like to ask questions early and get him talking. I don't like to start the conversation when I, gotta, I want to find some time to talk to this player about his game. I don't want to look like I'm lecturing the guy. Usually what I'll do is bring, I'll ask him to meet me at my office at a certain time or wherever it is and maybe in the lobby of the hotel, whatever. And I ask questions first of all. I want to get him to relax a little bit, open up a little bit, let him start the whole thing, okay? And then I find a way to start to bring my opinion to the table. One thing I found, guys, and I'm sure you have too, a lot of times when you're trying to help a player, try to change a player a little bit, they get into this victim mindset that, you know, that you're, not, you know, you're being hard on me, the, I don't play with the right guys, I'm not getting enough ice time. They're the victim of the circumstances that they're in. And that is something I've, I've always tried to really make sure I try to deal with early and tell kids, tell young men, you know, as soon as you start to understand that you're accountable for your own performance, it's not the people around you, sometimes it's you. Yes, sometimes there are some circumstances, but this victim mindset, you really got to fight that one if you can, because that's a difficult one. It's where a lot of people go. Immature athletes, they go into the victim mindset. You don't like me, you don't like the way I play. As I said, you don't play with the right guys, whatever and I don't play the power play, I'm a victim here. And you gotta make sure you fight that one because that one, that's really hard. It's uh, maturity is when they take responsibility. They realize suddenly, it's me. I gotta work on some things. I gotta change a little bit. And when that happens, you start to make progress. When they're in the victim mindset, you never get anywhere. To achieve change, you need to communicate. And anytime you're trying to change somebody, it creates friction, for sure. But you have to do that. One of the keys for you as a coach, if you're going to get your team to uh, become, one of the biggest challenges for us is to get the whole to be greater than the sum of the parts. To do that, you've got to get some people in that group to maybe change a little bit. Get them out of their comfort zone. Change their role. There's a word that sometimes comes up a lot. Change their role. And when you're trying to do that, guys get uneasy. Guys get a little sensitive to that. Because they have a... They have an opinion of themselves. They have a vision of themselves and what they can do. And sometimes they don't agree with what you're trying to do. So there's going to be some friction there. So I always talk about 
with coaches segmenting, okay, segmenting. And all of this is small steps. So if you're asking a player to become, say, a better defensive player, okay, the first thing I'll try to do is I take, my first step always is positioning on the ice. I'm going to talk to them about positioning, the important areas. What's the good ice to take away from the other team when they've got the puck? So I, that's the first thing to make a player a better player is get them in thinking about proper defensive positioning. And then I'm going to try to catch some moment, catch, uh, capture some moments when he does it right and show it to him. The second thing, after positioning, I want the player to become aware. So I'm going to work a little bit later, more games down the road, on his awareness. Now I've got you in position, you're doing a good job. Here's some examples of you coming back and you stopped in the right position, perfect. Now you've got to get awareness. What's happening away from the puck? Because when your team comes, becomes really good defensively away from the puck, you become a pretty good team in a hurry. You can defend yourself to a lot of wins when that happens, okay? So the second step for me then is awareness. The third step in, say, making a better defensive player is to get the guy to compete harder, to win more confrontations. And, and that's why I've always believed in the old adage, and I learned this from Father David Bauer, do one-on-ones every day. Every day in practice, you've got to have some compete drills. Because once you get a guy who's got good positioning, good awareness, and he will try to compete, you get, you're on your way to a pretty good player. I'll tell you about a guy, I think he's here, Mark Habscheid. He's in the back there, hiding in the back. When I was very fortunate to have Habby join our national team program in Calgary, like he came out of Major A, he was a phenomenal player and a, and a really good offensive player. Didn't have a clue defensively, okay? This guy couldn't check his hat, I'm telling you right now. But he had a terrific attitude, and that was number one. He had a terrific attitude. And all we did was put him in some situations where he wasn't comfortable. We made him kill penalties. And of course, the first question Mark asked was, do I have to block shots? You know? And we said, yeah, it's kind of part of it. You know? And he invented the stork position. Okay? <laughs> but he became a really good penalty killer, and he became a really good defensive player. And when he got his second chance in pro hockey, it was as a, more of a defensive player than it was as an offensive player. So it can be done, but it's segmenting. It's doing it in small steps, selling it along the way, uh, giving the guy a chance to really feel like he's getting somewhere. Anytime I have a meeting with a player, I always try to end it up on a positive note if I can. Something to build on. You never want a guy leaving a meeting pissed off and thinking, geez, not good things. You want him thinking, hey, the, the guy gave me, the coach gave me some solutions. He gave me some good concrete things I can think about, I can work on. Okay? And there's a plan. So here's an example. Dave Tippett, really a smart, smart coach. We had Shane Doan a few years ago. And if you know Shane Doan, he's one of the best leaders in hockey. He's so conscientious, he often is a problem to himself because he puts up barriers because he's, so, he's such a high achiever that he can get in his own way. You know, and Doner wasn't scoring very well. So Tipper, being a real smart coach, said to himself, I've got to get this guy playing better and I want him to play to his strengths. So Tipper, all Tipper came up with was a genius of an idea. He met with Donor, they talked about his scoring, and they came up with a little plan. And the plan was simple. Ten-point game for Shane Doan. Ten-point game every night. And the ten points were three shots or deflections. Three shots or deflections in a game. Three hits, because that's what Shane Doan does well. He really is a physical guy. A combination of three shot blocks or takeaways. So he's playing aggressively, defensively, and one point for being a plus player. So what Tipper really did, he got Shane Doan to come back to his strengths, to play to his strengths. So his targets were all things that Shane does well. He came right back to the things that give Shane confidence in his game. And that's smart coaching. That's smart coaching, and that's how you get people to get out of situations that they sometimes feel they can't get out of. Remember in coaching, it's the same with your children. What gets rewarded gets repeated. What gets rewarded gets repeated. And that's a big part of coaching. I mean, can we be positive all the time? I don't think we can. There's times when you 
when you do get you know, on the other side of it a bit. Uh, has anybody read that book by uh, Bobby Knight about negativity? He, ha he has a book about, it's a really interesting book, you should get it, Bobby Knight, the basketball coach. And he's always criticized for being a really a tough guy. And he talks about sometimes there's too much of this positive crap. He says it's good to be negative. And he gives you examples, and it's pretty smart stuff. This guy understands what he's talking about. You know, so you mix it up a little bit, but what gets rewarded gets repeated. So we do have to have a positive frame of mind when we're coaching and communicating. The three T's of business. Business has always had this. It's train, transfer, terminate. When they get a new employee, they'll give the guy lots of training. Work real hard with them. See what he can do. Okay? If it's going well, terrific. Sometimes it does. If it's not really going very well, then you have to go what's called transfer. Transfer is when you say, okay, it's not going the way we thought. We're going to have to make some changes. And I'm not talking now in the course of a couple of weeks. I'm not t talking about a course of a couple of months. Sometimes it's over a couple of seasons, this process. It isn't something you do in a week, train, transfer, terminate, psh, gone. You've got to give the guy time. It takes time to get change. So it comes transfer. Transfer simply means... Can we change the situation? Can we transfer the situation a little bit? So maybe, for example, we've got a guy who um, is not playing very well, so we say transfer. So I might go to my assist, one of my assistant coaches and say, I'd like you to spend a lot of time with this guy. And here's what we'd like to try to do. Uh, we're going to do some different things with him. Uh, maybe use a little bit more video. We're going to take a little different approach. Um, and so you transfer some responsibility to other people. or Transfer might simply mean changing lines. He goes from this forward line to that line. Plays with different people. Maybe transfer means he plays some different situations. But you transfer the whole thing to try to give him another chance. Try to find out. You want to find out where he fits in, and he wants to find out where he fits in as well. Okay? And then sometimes you get to terminate. Sometimes it takes four or five months. Sometimes it takes a season and a half or two seasons. But you do get there sometimes. And you have to not be afraid sometimes to terminate because it's best for both parties. Okay? Sometimes termination is best for both parties. It gives him a new start and you a new start. Okay? So train, usually the guy's considered to be a prospect. He comes to your organization and you think you've got a real prospect. It's always bad when he becomes a project because now you're getting a guy who... You know, you're seeing too many holes, you're having a hard time with this guy. So now he's moved from prospect to project. And that's, they know too. Players always know what's going on. They have a sense for what, what's happening to them. And so when a guy goes from prospect to project, that's a red flag. And then I always use terminate, I mean be proactive. Good organizations find a way to realize this player's not going to fit in and we've got to give him a new chance. We have to regain something as well for our organization. So they, timing is the key. If you ever uh, read anything about Sam Pollock, Sam Pollock, that was one of his uh, key things, was always to move people at the right time. When he knew enough about a player to be sure of what he was giving up, he was never afraid to move the player and, because he knew what he was giving up. Okay. He never gave up a guy in a trade that came back to haunt him very often. That would happen. It was rare for him. And so he's a smart guy. You know, he's a real smart guy, one of the best general managers ever in the game. So that's a very interesting sequence of events that happens. And it's, this is a hard part of coaching. When you get into this stuff here, that's when you really earn your money. Labeling players. This is always very interesting. There is a tendency, guys, in the game, I think sometimes we label people. We just slap a label on a guy. And there's a couple of reasons. One, let's go to the second point. It can sometimes take the coach off the hook. If you, and, and it, it, what two traits does this always, generally speaking, we have two traits in the game that we label. What could be one label? Bob? The guy is not tough. He's a chicken. Okay? So that's been a label that's been used in the game forever. Not tough. 
This guy shies away from all the contact. This guy's not a tough guy. He's a soft player. Another label we use a lot is he's not smart. And sometimes those labels, all they do is take the coach off the hook for failure. Like the guy, yeah, the guy's probably not going to make it. And it just takes you off the hook. And I think that's, you've got to deal with that. I mean, that's too easy for the coach to simply say, this guy is not smart. Can't work with this guy. He does not smart enough. Not all our players are perfect. Okay, we get a lot of players that uh, require a lot of time. And the trouble is sometimes, the players that require the most time really make sometimes not a very large contribution. They don't make a big difference. And you've got to recognize that sometimes as a coach. But that's really important. It can take you off the hook. And the other thing you've got to be really careful of, sometimes when you slap a label on, it presumes there's no chance the guy could change. I've seen guys change. I have seen in my coaching career a lot of guys change. And I've, as a coach, and, and dealing with, a, with teams making trades, we've let guys go that were a mistake. When I coached in Calgary, we had uh, Brian Scrudlin. We got him in a trade from Montreal. And Brian Scrudlin was an unbelievable leader, okay? And we had the expansion that year. So we had to make a decision. He's getting older, and uh, could we leave him unprotected? And, or should we let one of our younger guys go unprotected? And we didn't value leadership enough. And we left him unprotected, and he went to Florida. And that team, in a couple of years, was right in the Stanley Cup final, Florida. And he was leading the parade. So, you know, we didn't know what we were giving up, you know. And, uh, and one of the knocks against him was he's getting too old. He's getting slow. That was another label. He's too slow now. Well, there's a lot of guys that get to the puck or get to certain places real fast on the ice. They never have the puck. Scrooge was a real smart player. And we didn't... Uh, we missed the boat there. So uh, in hockey, toughness and game sense are two things you, t you tend to label a lot. And really, sometimes toughness and game sense, it's nothing more than confidence. It's nothing more than confidence. A lot of players don't show any game sense until they're confident. And now that's always a challenge because building confidence, kids have to play and get an opportunity. And when they don't get much of an opportunity, and they do go on the ice, and they're afraid to make mistakes, they're afraid to fail, then you get a real problem. They're never going to show you what they can do. They're never going to show you their real ability um, because they're just afraid to make a mistake. And, and, that's, and there's players the same in toughness. There's guys that are tougher than you think. They just, uh, you know, they have never fought very much. They don't know if they can fight. You know, they don't know if I go and smack somebody with a good body check, if I have to fight, can I, can I get it done? And that's less and less in the game now than ever before. But those are things we have to be aware of. Um, fear of failure, as I said earlier, it takes away your instinctive play. When you're afraid to make a play, you're never going to play the game really very well because you're just not going to have that instinctive play. Okay, you're going to have the puck and you're going to want to get rid of the puck. And when you want to get rid of the puck, you're not going to make as many good plays as you should make. So it's really, really important. And I think the last thing here, guys, self-confidence has a greater relationship to performance than talent. And it does. When a guy's really feeling confident about his game, you'll see a level of skill that sometimes can surprise you. It's because he's feeling good about his game. And then there's no question. There'll be times, too, when he'll fluctuate a little bit. It's not always a... Uh, confidence is not always a consistent from start to finish. There's going to be players that... It's going to fluctuate, and so is their performance going to fluctuate. But be really careful, if you would, with labels. I think labels sometimes are just an easy way to get off the hook, and I, and I don't agree with that. How do you achieve consistency with your team? There's not a coach in this room that shouldn't want that. You want your team to become more consistent. That's what you're always trying to achieve. You want to get to know after a while. It's like your team's like Campbell's soup. You open the can, and out comes that game every night. You know, we can't get that every night, but you're trying to achieve that consistency in performance. And one thing you have to understand is your standards are the most important thing. Yes, there's tactics and skills to the game. Tactics and skills play a, play a major role in the game, for sure. But your standards, your work ethic, your concentration, your compete level, your preparation to play, those are your standards. 
that really determine almost everything else. When those things are not there, you have to be concerned as a coach. Your tactics are going to suffer. Some nights not be as good. Your skills won't be as good some nights. You're going to have a, a good goaltending performance by the other team. They're going to beat you. Your power play is going to fail some night. That's just the way it is. That happens. But you can't have too much fluctuation in the work, the concentration, the compete level, the preparation to play. And as Bab said last night, that's what you have to do. You have to keep everybody energized. That's your job. It's hard. It's easy at the start of the year and it's easy in the playoffs. But boy, in the mid-season on, you know, you've got to be the energizer bunny. You've got to be the guy who comes to the rink and gets everybody started. You've got to start their motors. That's your job. So you've got to start your own motor. So you've got to look after yourself too. You've got to look after yourself too. That's really, really important. Your team, this is an obvious statement, your team has to be good at, uh, at things that happen a lot in the game. You've got to be good at common reoccurring situations if you want your team to be consistent. Your board play, being able to chip the puck out against a pinch and get it into the middle zone. You know, uh, little things like that. Those things, defenseman going back and checking for his first pass before he needs it. Those things are, they reoccur every shift. So you've got to be good at those little things. Those details make the difference. They make the difference, and that's the key right there. They're common reoccurring situations that occur every game, every shift. Make sure your club's good at those things. If you are, you're going to win a lot of games just based upon that because your level of execution is going to be pretty good. Okay? And that's something that uh, we've done a pretty good job with is uh, spending a lot of time working on game-like drills to automate certain parts of our game. Okay? Wingers work on board work. Defensemen work on a lot of little skills in their game, and Glenn's going to talk about that. So that's really important. You need more carriers than carried. So really, there's just two broad categories of players. There's the carriers. They're the guys that can, when the going gets tough, they dig in, they carry people. And then there's guys that sometime you have to carry. You know, that's one of the great mysteries in coaching, is there are sometimes a lot of guys that have to be carried in tough times. And that's why you, you're not consistent. If you get more carriers, You'll be good. You'll be good. And you got to, and that's identification. That's training camp. That's your, uh, and a lot of you guys have player lists, those, your scouting. That's really important. That goes into character, which is huge. Carriers and carried. Um, we have, in, uh, in Shane Doan, we have a carrier. He's a guy who carries a lot of people. Okay? And then we have guys on our team that have to be carried. And that's really a problem. They slow you down. They weight you down. They take a lot out of you. Okay? Your team has to be able to focus and more importantly, in bold letters there, I have refocus. Every game starts out terrific. Every game you think you're going to win. Every game you have your video plan, you have your meeting. God, it's going to be great tonight. We're going to play great, okay? But stuff happens. The referee is not kind that night. The other team doesn't want to lose. Your goalie's struggling, whatever. But you're going to meet some adversity. So you have to be able not just to get focused before the game, you've got to be able to get refocused during the game. And that is really hard to refocus during the game. That is your test. Developing pre-game focus I think is easy, but to develop focus in the middle of the game, when things aren't going well, when you're faced with some adversity, that's really, really important, okay? So that's a skill. And you're the, you're the guy who starts that. You're the guy that starts the refocus process, okay? So that's where you play your major role in tough times. And hey, I love coaching when you always got the puck and you're winning. That's great stuff, you know? But when you're losing and you're in a bit of a tough time, you're not doing well, the results aren't there, you got to be the guy who finds solutions to those things. Winning teams, consistent teams have a single mindset that starts to build within the team. And it's really enhanced when your top players buy in. And again, Mike alluded to this last night, the ability for you to coach your top players. If you're afraid to coach your top players, you're going to have problems. You're going to have some problems. And I'll tell you why. When you have a double standard on your team, players recognize that. 
Okay, players recognize that. So anytime that you have uh, double standards, you're going to open the door here for some difficulty, and I'll talk about that right here. Let's go to accountability. I'll come back to leaving clues. Accountability exists on your team. So if you talk about you want effort, you want people to block some shots, people to pay the price, and you've got some guys that won't do it, players know first. They know what's going on. You've talked about you want your team, everybody to dig in all the time, compete. So the players know first that certain guys aren't doing it. The second thing is the players are watching you. They know it, so they figured out, okay, if I know it, this guy should know it behind the bench. Okay? So they, they're watching you. Are you going to deal with this? Are you going to coach your best players? Guys dogging it, are you going to deal with it? If you're not, then you're going to have a problem. As soon as you deal with it. See, the players want accountability. They do. They know discipline wins. If they're all on the same page, they all dig in together, they know synergy. We can achieve more. So that's a really important sequence for the coach to remember. The players know first. The players are watching you. The players want accountability. They want discipline. They know it's winning hockey. Okay? So once you do that, what do you get? You get trust. They start to trust you because they know what you say and do are the same things. You say it and it's not being done. You do something about it. And now you've got, suddenly got a chance to get more guys on board. And that's really important. Just to go back for a second here, um, team understands and appreciates the value of practice. That's really important. Practices should be challenging, competitive, and they should be, I hope, some fun for the players and some fun for you. And I think it's really good. I think if you watch, you watch really good teams practice, like I remember one year watching the Chicago Blackhawks came in. Maybe Mooner was coaching with them. And Daryl Sutter was the head coach. And I watched their practice. And man, work and work on the, working on good, uh, good game-like situational drills, uh, things that happen a lot in the course of a game. It was a really up-tempo, hard practice. And then I realized, this is why these guys have won all these games. This guy, that's why this team's hard to play against. They value practice. I mean, these guys came out and they worked. And they worked really hard for about 50 minutes. And I'm telling you, it was impressive. You got a feeling about that team. That's going to be a tough team to play against. So when your players value and understand the value of practice, you got it going. Okay, so that's your job to create that environment with your enthusiasm, with the things you do on the ice, the drills you use. Those are the important things, okay? That really makes a difference. Success leaves clues, and as a coach, you have to constantly encourage and reinforce these clues. And they're often specific to your team. But when you get a, a team that blocks a lot of shots, that's a clue. Stress it. We're doing a great job of it, you know? If your team really digs in and wins a lot of one-on-one -on -one battles, and they, that's a clue. Keep that part of your focus with the team. So when you're winning and you're watching your team, maybe a, a video of your team playing, and you see things that <coughs> define your identity, grab those things. Reinforce those things every day, every drill. Reinforce those things with your guys, okay? So like when I do one-on-one -on -one drills, I always tell the guys, this is a really important part of the game. This is what it's going to come down to. We can look at a goal that's, that we score, and it was the one-on-one -on -one in a corner in our end where it started. We won that confrontation, and that puck ended up in their net about 10 or 12 seconds later. But that's where it started. And then, of course, we can use those great old things. You know, good defense leads to good offense. All that salesmanship. Well, that's where it starts from, right there. Okay? So... Success leaves clues, reinforce those things, keep it going. Chemistry exists on your team. It's collective character. That's what chemistry is. And I talked last night to you, I talked about see it, appreciate it, acknowledge it. Did anybody watch uh, TSN this morning, sports, uh, sports desk this morning? Interesting thing, there's a, a picture for the, uh, the Blue Jays. They were down, I think, 8-1 or 8-2 to the Red Sox. And they came back, the Blue Jays won 9-8. Okay? And... They're hitting the ball to the park. Boston gets up and scores 8-8, and a guy hits a real rope right in the hole. Okay? And that center fielder goes over, 
and he just lunges and he makes one hell of a catch for a very important out in the game. And the pitcher takes his glove off and does this. And the camera's got him. He's looking at the guy, making eye contact with his fielder when he gets up, and he's doing this. He's a, he saw it, and he's, he appreciates it like hell. He really appreciates it, and he's acknowledging it. When your teammates start to do that for you, that peer, not peer pressure, but that acknowledgement from your peers, God, it starts everything going. Now your team starts to really dig in and become the team you want to become. So it's, they're the guy. You can say good things, but when teammates say it to teammates, man, it's a huge impact, and that's really, really important. And then the last thing, we've got to talk a little hockey here, but tactically, if you want to be a consistent team, these are all kind of mental things, tactically, unforced turnovers are low. Unforced turnovers are low. In other words, you're smart with the puck. It's really important to be smart with the puck. You know, we used to call it puck control, now it's called puck management. Um, you know, game sense is now hockey IQ. I can keep going if you like on all that stuff. But it is very interesting that really, if unforced turnovers are low, you win a lot of games. There's going to be forced turnovers. That happens. That's part of the game. It's when you make a mistake you shouldn't make. When you play in such a way that you make the other team better, this is not good. You always want to play to make your team better. You never want to start playing to make the other team better than they are. So that's really, really important. So tactically, obviously, puck control is really important. The art of coaching. That is, I think, separates a lot of people. There's an old expression. When I was a young coach coming up, I remember old coaches always saying, uh, it's better to be respected than liked. And that's true, I guess. But why not both? Why can't you be respected, okay, and liked? You know, both. Accomplish both. I mean, you, you know, it's really interesting. The best coaches, if you think about this, the best coaches are hard to please and easy to play for. Mike Babcock's an easy, player, easy coach to play for. He really is. Guys like him because he's straightforward. He tells you what he should tell you. He substantiates it if he has to with video. He gets you playing the right way, okay? And he does it in the right manner. And that's why he's a good coach. Dave Tippett, Willie Desjardins. That's what these guys do so well, okay? They're hard to please. They want more. They want you to give more, play better. But they coach in such a way that they're easy to play for. Yes, they make you work. And yes, they make you pay attention to detail, but they do it in a way that you know it's good for you. The player understands, this is good for me. This is what I have to do. This is how we're going to win. And so that's really important. If you're constantly telling your players why and not just how, that's, that's really important. I mean, you can get a good player by telling them, you know, how to do it. But boy, once you tell them why he's doing it, he really becomes a better player. Once a player understands why he's doing it, what element of his game has gone up a little bit? His game sense. When a guy understands why, how to do it, but I understand why I'm, I'm doing it, then you're starting to improve his game sense. His decisions will improve on the ice. And suddenly you're going to get a better player. Okay? So that's, that's a, another really important thing. And I repeat myself again here. What gets rewarded gets repeated. And that's how you develop good habits. Good habits in teams, okay? And good habits are really, really important. That's how you get an... If you get a guy who's not a perfect player, and there's lots of those, a guy who sometimes you hold your breath when he's on the ice, if you can teach him some good habits, automate some of those things, I hate to use the word, but maybe you kind of program a little bit, he plays better for you. He plays more effectively for you. So he gets more satisfaction too because he knows he's contributing to you. So you got to do that. You can say this another way if you like. What gets rewarded gets repeated. Let's go the other way. You get what you tolerate. As a coach, you get what you tolerate. If you tolerate some guys dogging it, some guys not blocking shots when they should, some guys not competing when they should, some guys not living off the ice like they should, that's what you get. So you get what you tolerate. 
And that's why coaching is difficult because you've got to give people feedback. And sometimes they're your top players. They're your top players. When you get your top players playing the way you want them to play and living the way you want them to live, everything on your team gets easier. Everybody starts to get in line. So you've got to find a way to work with those top people. And that's, in many situations, that's really a huge challenge because it's not easy. Some of those guys are firm believers in how they do their things. You've got to find a way. Have a vision and share it with your team every day if you can. I was talking to a, a gentleman, I think he coaches AAA in, uh, in Yorkton last night, and he was saying he has this in mind, he has a mindset of how he wants his team to play, and that's what he's saying. He has a vision for what he's trying to create with his team, and that's what we all do. I mean, I want my team to play fast, smart, disciplined. I mean, I got a big wish list there, but I, you know, I, I always want my teams to play real competitively. I never want the other team to have an easy night against our team. I always want the other team to have to play pretty well to beat us. Okay? I'd like, it's not always going to work out, but I'd like to come out of the game with people saying, that team's hard to play against. Because when that team's hard to play against, you're going to win your share of games. You're going to win your share of games. So have that vision for what you want, and then share it with your team in drills. We're doing this drill because this is what it relates to. Okay? This happens a lot in a game. You've got to do that. And then you get there. It's a slow process. In the art of coaching, you have to understand that risk must exist. It's impossible to play this game without risk. And that's so we, we came up with the expression a long time ago, risk and reward. You know, what's the risk? What's the reward? And that's how you teach players to make better decisions. Here's what you did in this zone stick handling by a checker in front of your net or at the blue line in your own zone is probably not a good idea, okay? That's, that's a high risk and a low reward. You're not going to get for you. Even if you beat that guy, what have you got? You've got another 150 feet to go. So you do those things. That's how you teach players how to make good decisions. But there has to be risk and reward. And you guys know this. Good decisions with bad execution, it's going to happen. Sometimes the kid's got the right idea, the pass is not a good pass, or the reception is not a good reception. And that's going to happen. That's part of our game. That's part of our game. When you pass the puck, there is a chance that sometimes it's not going to connect. They don't all connect. But when you make bad decisions, it doesn't matter what execution you have, it's going to be a turnover. And that can't happen. That's what you're trying to reduce. With good practice, you can make bad decisions, bad execution. That's why we do a lot of drills in passing and receiving, seeing the ice. Okay? Working to get open. Open the passing lane. All those things you talk about. Good things. Okay? And bad decisions, though, that's a real problem. And that's one of the areas you're trying to cut down on. Okay? Keep coaching during the game. Good coaches keep coaching during the game. They don't assume that fetal position. By the fetal position, I mean a lot of guys do this. And you can see them behind the bench, and they're squeezing like hell. They're white knuckling it, and they're just like this. Oh, God, if they're in pain, okay? And I'm watching, thinking, holy, and they don't talk, and they're just like this, like, holy crap, what's going on out there? I think you've got to be active as a coach. That's my, just my opinion. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. You know, you can be as, as distant if you like. But I think you've got to keep coaching, because the players are watching you. And if you watch Willie, Tip, Babs, coaches like that, they're constantly working. And when the game isn't going well, they're working harder. They're using cue words. Simple cue words that get guys thinking the right things, okay? They're active. They're active with players, and sometimes they even get on the referee a little bit just because they want to get the guys on the bench knowing, hey, he's in, a, he's in the game, you know? So you got to start their motors in tough times. you got to get them going. So you have to do that. you got to keep coaching. I've seen guys when the game's they're down two or three goals, and they're in this one here, and they're pissed off, and they're just like this, okay? We've got a coach. That's our job. Our job is, boy, in tough times, we have to step up to the plate. We've got to get it done, okay? That's important. Okay. How do you help a player improve his decisions? That's a real challenge. Generally speaking, guys, there's no improvement. It's not possible without improvement in self-confidence. So positive feedback is important. 
Pause of video support is really important. And capture them doing it right. If you can capture on video a young player doing something right, those are really good moments for him. You can get other players and show other players doing it for him, but when he does it and does it right, those are really important times to kindle his fire a little bit by showing him some of those things. Players often can't get bigger, can't get stronger, can't get faster. They can get smarter. And they can become, they can improve their game sense a little bit. Sometimes it's not their game sense more than it's habits, automating responses, but it is an effect on the game sense. And so we can make them smarter. So they learn to use what they already have better. And I've had lots of players like that who just suddenly start to use what they already have better and they're more effective. They become better players for you. They produce more for you. And that's really important. The whole can't be greater than the sum of the parts unless players accept and execute roles. You have to get guys to play roles within a team. They can't all be on the power play. They can't all play in every offensive situation. You have to have some guys that do carry the spears, you know. And there's guys that ride the horses. It's like the army. That's just the way it is. You've got to have guys that uh, will accept that. And that's, that's one of the real challenges in coaching is, is getting guys into roles. I'm going to skip a slide here. When you're trying to go to develop roles, basically there's four stages of learning. The first stage of learning is the beginner stage. You've got a young guy and you're saying to him, we, we're going to have you become a defensive I hate that word, don't they? Right away they're going, oh Christ, defensive. So use the word responsible. A really responsible, accountable player. Be careful with defensive. Habby hated that word. Okay, you gotta use the, you gotta sell it. So you gotta put a little different flavor on it. So the beginner stage is it's a new role. He may not be happy. He's probably a little uncertain. So you as a coach gotta give him high direction, high support. You gotta tell him what you want specifically what he's got to do, you got to make it clear. Because if it's clear, you got a chance. He may not accept it. If it's clear, he can do it. And that's the difference. They've done all kinds of things on roles. And sometimes guys never accept the role, but they understand the role. They're clear on the role and they can do it. Okay? Hopefully they learn to love it. Not always does it always happen. The second stage is they're disillusioned. You've put them in a new role, they're very inconsistent and they know it, and they're frustrated, and they're not real happy, and they're not playing very well, and they're wondering, this new role, it's not very good. I'm not enjoying this at all. I'm, I'm a better player than this. I should be doing something else. So there's a lot of doubt. So you've got to stay with high direction, more feedback, and high support. You can do this. Stay positive with the guy. You can do this. And this is how your role, if you can do this, this is how it's going to help our team. He's got to see how that role fits in to us winning. And once he makes that connection, things start to happen. The third stage is a cautious stage. Now he's performing a little better, okay? So now you can give him a little bit less direction, but keep the high support going. You're, doing, you're, you're moving in the right direction. You're getting there. And he probably knows it too, but he's glad to hear it from you because that's important. And then the last stage is the achievement stage. He's very good at the role now. He needs low direction, low support. And sometimes when a guy gets to this stage, achievement stage, they're not always really happy with it. They still think they can do more. But it's clear. They understand what they're doing. They see what they're doing is really contributing to the team. It's contributing to winning. And now all of a sudden, they're buying in. They're buying in, okay? Um, dealing with adversity. This is a real hard part about coaching because uh, not a lot of teams want to let you win. You have to go out there and make them, make them want to quit, okay? So you've got to learn to master your own personality. We all have an instinctive uh, leadership style. I have an instinctive leadership style that not all players appreciate, but that's just the way it is. But what I've done, like I am, I've got a, I kind of have a short fuse sometimes, okay? And uh, the only short fuse I don't have is with my grandchildren. I have a long fuse with them. But with a lot of things, I have a short fuse. So I used to, I had to learn 
what's called situational leadership, situational personality. I had to rehearse some things in my mind, like, hey, the game suddenly, there's a big telling play that goes the wrong way. How do I deal with that? If I'm kicking the garbage can and cursing and swearing, that's one way to react. But there's got to be a better way. So I really worked at trying to become the master of my personality, not have it master me. Now you can ask some of the guys who played for me with the Huskies, oh yes, there was a few rants in the dressing room at times. Uh, and I did kick a garbage can or two. I kicked one that was metal one time, weighed about 200 pounds, it didn't go very far. So, you know, you learn, uh, you learn the hard way. But you have to learn situational leadership. You've got to take mastery of your own personality. Too many war stories, guys. Too many stories about guys and players being treated improperly by coaches. Too many stories like that in our game. We can still get results and still treat them respectfully. Okay? Yes, we can be firm. Yes, we can be tough. It's how we do it. But you've got to respect these people you're coaching. Okay? You can't, some of the things I hear, I, I don't think they're very good. I think it's the wrong way. It's a bad message. You've got to remove the temptation for some players to give up. In tough times and adversity, some players do give up. And that's a great mystery as to why some guys keep going and other guys pack it in. I don't know. It, what does it come down to? Character. It comes down to their character. It comes down to that the first victory always has to be the victory over yourself. When you get into adversity, that's the first victory. Gotta, I, gotta, I can do this. If it's, holy God, I'm not sure I can do this, and you get doubting yourself, you're probably not going to beat the other team. So the first victory has got to come over yourself. Okay? And that's really important. We have this every day. We're going to have lunch here pretty soon. And there may be a dessert tray there. And you might be a guy who's a couple of pounds on the heavy side. We're going to check. We're going to check on you right now and see what your situational leadership is like. Can you deal with that? Okay? Can you win the battle with yourself? Because yourself is saying, oh, I'd love to have that. And we have it all the time, you know? So we've got to deal with that. Every season has adversity. I've coached for a, I don't know how many years, and I wish I could say there was a really easy season, and there hasn't been. Every season. And it's the same things that happen. Injuries, travel, you find a way to get into a slump or something, you know, tough schedule. All those things happen for all teams. So adversity, it's a natural part of the process with your team. It's going to happen. So they got to understand, this is just the way it is, guys. It's part of the territory. We're never going to have a perfect season. It's not going to happen. We're going to have adversity. And how do you help the guys around that? Well, first of all, People usually, when they have to put a lot into something, have a hard time quitting. So I've always believed in good hard practices, hard fitness, that type of thing. Because I think people can do more than they think they can. I think we err a lot on the side of rest, recovery. And we have to sometimes. But I've seen in other countries how players work. And it's different. It's different. So you can do more than you think you can. And you've got to make sure your players understand that. You as people know that. You're mature people now, most of you. Okay? So you, you understand that you can do more than sometimes you think you can. And you've done it with your careers. Okay? So when teams value that they've had to work hard, they're going to hang in there longer. And then facing adversity is always a battle with yourself. And you as the coach set the example. You're the guy who sets the example. They're in tough times. They're all watching the game. And, but they're really watching you, too, as to what you're doing. How much leadership can you come up with? Can you help them? And really, if you think about this, it's how you respond. Not just your team, it's you. It's how you respond to adversity that's really important. If your team fights back and gives it a good effort, that's good stuff. You can build on that. You can build on that. It doesn't have to be a win. Okay? Selecting your team. This is the last part of my presentation. I'll have some questions. If you want to have some questions, go ahead. Selecting your team. This is really important. Now, in the NHL, we don't have a lot of that. We do have a few positions open, but a lot of times it's dictated almost for you by, by the contracts. But if you're selecting your team, value the intangibles. A player is like an iceberg. He's just like an iceberg. 
about 15% is above the water. And that's what you can see. You can see his skills and his lack of skill, whatever it is. You can, that's easy to, to judge. That 85% below the water, that's what you're trying to find out. So sometimes you've got to do your homework. You've got a training camp and you've got two weeks to select some players. And some guys in short term can fool you a little bit. So do your homework. Find out from other coaches who have coached them. What is this guy like? What's his compete level? If you've got scouts that work for your organization, did they give you some feedback into what he possesses? What's inside of this guy? Because the 15% above the water, that's easy identification. That 85% below the water makes the difference, and that's the hardest part to figure out. Okay, so that's really, really important to us. Um, so value intangibles, heart. I had a guy at the University of Saskatchewan named John Bechtold. Okay? Bad skater. Bad shooter. Bad stick handler. Great player. Great player. Great player. Because he, he won every battle. He competed every shift. If he didn't play a lot, he didn't say boo. He still cheered for the guys. He was an amazing individual. And, but not a very good player. But I can remember once leaving the rink after a real hard workout, and I usually did a little bit of work in the office, and I was leaving the rink and I could hear this skate noise. I'm thinking, what the heck is that? I look way down the far end of the rink, and he's doing change of direction things in the corners. You know, trying to work on his game, getting the puck to the net. That was John Bechtold. When this guy left the University of Saskatchewan, the guys thought so much of him, there's an award called the John Bechtold Hustle Award, and that's him. He was important to our team, okay? But there was intangibles there that were huge, okay? And I remember the first few games of the season, I didn't play him a couple times, and we kept losing those games. And I kept thinking, every time I play this guy, we win. He doesn't score, but we don't win. And then I really figured it out, being real smart. He does a lot for our team. He sets the standard. He sets the standard, okay? He's an important guy, all right? Um, there's strength and diversity. When I coached the Flames, I had guys like Theron Fleury, Gary Roberts, okay? They do not want to watch one second of videotape. They don't give a damn about the other team. Sometimes I don't think they know who we're playing. It's just another team and they want to kill them. They want to beat them. They want to win. And then on the other end of the scale, there's Joe Neuendijk and, and uh, Joel Otto. Very analytical guys. They want to get prepared. They, they want to see what the other team does. They want to know those things. That's comfort for them. That helps them. So there's diversity in your team. You're going to have guys that prepare differently, value different things. That's the way it is. Get lots of players that love the game. And I was talking to Tipper yesterday. I said, you know, he practices like he's trying to make the team, uh, make the team every game, every practice. That's how hard he practices. And Tipper said, no, no. At this stage in his career, after he gets warmed up, he practices like he's trying to make the team every game, or, or like make the team uh, every practice. And that's Shane Doan. Shane Doan works like hell. He's just a hard working guy. He sets the standard. Okay? He loves the game. When this guy has to retire, it's going to be a sad, sad day for a lot of people because he's an amazing individual. Ice bags and loose pucks. That's my favorite expression in the game ice bags and loose pucks. I think that's how you win. I think that's the secret to the game. I really do. I can draw you lots of X and O's, but I really believe if my team gets to more loose pucks than your team does, you're going to be chasing me, and I love the game when we have the puck. I'm the best coach in hockey when we have the puck. That's when we don't have the puck. You're not, it's not as much fun. So get to the puck. Get players around the puck. Be hard on the puck. That's how you win. So you got to do battle drills. You got to do compete drills. Guys got to learn when they got the puck. If they haven't got to play, they got to protect it. They got to buy time for other guys to get open. Those skills are really important. It's really, really important. So get to the puck, get players around the puck, be hard on the puck. On ice talk. Everybody on your team becomes a smarter player, has more game sense when you talk. So when I tell a guy where his play is, he becomes suddenly a smart player. He makes the right play. So if your teams talk, your, all your players, all their game sense goes up when you talk. And can we get everybody to talk enough? I don't think there's a team in hockey that talks enough. 
You win when you deserve to win. If you don't compete, you don't do the little things that make a difference, you will not win. Okay? You only win when you deserve to win. It's better to have the puck than to chase the puck. Does that make a lot of sense? I can remember coaching uh, against the Russian national team in 1984 at the Izvestia, 83 at the Izvestia Cup, and you can ask Tipper, I don't think for the first 20 minutes we got the puck. We were just so damn glad to get a face off, it gave us a chance to at least see it for a little bit, because it was hard. And they were really good, okay? They were really good. And they could zip that, uh, zip that puck around, and uh, you learn one thing, you can't, go, you can't skate as fast as you can pass the puck, okay? And, but those are great things. But you, if you have the puck, make them chase you, you're going to be real good. Here's a simple point. Sounds so simple. You need some skill. You need some playmakers. You've got to have guys that can make plays. If you're going to get something off the rush, that's a playmaking skill. You, you hear a lot of the, uh, the between periods interviews and the guys say you've got to get the puck deep. That's true. And then we've got to work it deep. That's true. And we've got to get it to the net get screens on the goalies, and that's true. But you watch Tampa and Chicago, both these teams generate quite a bit off the rush. And that's having guys that can make plays. You know, guys who can make plays. You hear the football coaches talking about that? You know, the playmaker's got to make plays today. So that running back's got to, he's got to juke two guys. Somebody gets a hole, but he's got to, he's going to meet a defender. Can he beat that guy? Can he be a playmaker? And it's the same in hockey. We have to have guys when you get across the blue line that can make plays. You have to have defensemen that can find the middle on the breakout. You got to have people that can make those kind of plays, okay? And that's that's part of coaching. Uh, don't give it away. Make them chase it. Have to take it away. That's always important. And then ice bags. I think when you win, there's lots of ice bags. You know, when you win, you, you'll see it. Your team's got ice bags on. It hurts to win. I like, get hurts to win. You get hurt when you're trying to win, because you will pay the price. And you'll have to have some ice bags. So I've always believed in that loose pucks and ice bags, and maybe I'll put that on my headstone when I go. Loose pucks and ice bags. Okay, any questions at all? Feel free to ask. It's, it's hard sometimes when, you, when, you're, when you're putting a player into a role, you are putting some type of a label on them. But it's not one of those labels that I think, you know, that, He's a chicken or he's, uh, he's not smart. But you are. There's no question. If you're going to be effective, some players have to play a certain way. And so there is a little bit of a, there's some relationship there to a, to a label. It's just the key is let him flex out sometimes. Give him a chance to get some situations where he can flex out of that role. For example, if I'm down a couple of goals some nights and my top guys aren't going, I might let my third and fourth lines play in some situations they don't normally play in. Give them a chance to flex out a little bit. You know, give them a chance to play a little bit more. You know? I mean, I've done some stupid things. You could talk to Habby. We were in Finland one time. And we were just going through the motions. It was pathetic against the Finnish uh, national B team, I think it was. So again, in those days, I didn't have very much situational leadership. I kind of just reacted. So I called the timeout, brought the guys over and said, okay, uh, the five, five guys, one unit playing well. I said, you guys stay on the ice. Don't come off. And they looked at me like, pardon me? I said, yeah, don't come off the ice. Just don't change. I want you to play until I decide we'll make a change. And I think we went eight and a half to nine minutes with the same five guys playing. They didn't score. We played okay. Wasn't pretty. But all those guys on the bench are watching going, holy jeez, you know, like what are we doing here? And that's just, you know, I mean, it was stupid. I look back and go, oh, God, how dumb could I be? But I got the point across. And the, for their, that point on the season, I never had to talk to the guys about competing and working because I was stupid. And I did something that kind of worked, but it, it was the way it was. So it's good to talk to you. Bobby? Tipper's next, right? Tipper's next. Oh, penalty killing. One of the best penalty killers ever to play the game was Dave Tippett.